Welcome to the Pat Mayo Experience Sony Open DraftKings Picks. In preview, want to remind everyone to subscribe to the audio version of this podcast. If you want to listen to it on demand, uncut, and don't have to look at my beautiful visage, you can do that on iTunes, Stitcher, and Google Play. Or if you're listening to this and you want to see my beautiful visage, subscribe to the DraftKings YouTube page. Check it out up there and wherever you're at. Give the episode a like, leave a review. Goes a long way into spreading the show. It takes like less than a second. And it's all I really ask for. Plus, the winners of the DraftKings Bucks that I'm giving away for the new studio giveaway, I'll announce later in the week or potentially early next week. I've submitted the names, so I just want to make sure that all the money is in there before I give it out and I announce the winners. People are like, oh, it hasn't shown up yet. Just don't all wait till it shows up and then I'll announce the winners. Then boom, check your account. It's already going to be in there. It's going to be glorious, like Christmas morning. Joining me on the show today to break everything down from the PowerHourPod.com and the Fan- the degenerate, or the fantasy golf degenerates. I always get it backwards. It's Kenny Kim. What's going on, dude? Pat, man, it's always a pleasure to be on the show. Looking forward to talk about the Sony Open this week. Uh, always a fun tournament, uh, especially, you know, comparatively to last week. You know, full field, all that good stuff, so I'm ready for it. Yeah, so let's, let's dig right in here. If people don't know and they're just playing golf for the first time or whatever, last week is not really indicative of how everything works. That would be the Tournament of Champions. It only had 34 players, no cut. That's more like a WGC event, which crop up throughout the year. But now we're dealing, like you mentioned, full field, 144 players at YLICC. And if you've played the Super Nintendo or N64 game, you'll get a sense of the course just a little bit. There's 6.2 million in the prize pool, 7,044 yards, just a poor seven, par 70, mind you. Justin Thomas is the defending champion here. Uh, when I think about the key stats and everything that goes into it, ball striking is foremost on my mind. You don't need to hit the fairways here. In fact, it's incredibly difficult to hit the fairways at YLI, the lowest hit fairway percentage of any course on tour over the past three years, but you can play from the rough. It's not that bad. It's like really teeny rough. So I wouldn't be too worried about that. Just get guys that bomb it down there, get access accessibility to the par fives, make some eagles, do some scoring on these short par fours, 400 to 450 yard efficiency and strokes gained is what I'm looking for there. What do you see from this course and the types of players that we should be targeting? Yeah, I mean, that makes sense. When you look at the course, I mean, you know, you look at hole 18, which is one of the worst... Uh... <laughs> you know, fairway hit percentages on tour. It's something like 32%, but still it's one of the easiest par fives on the course. So that sort of lets you know that driving accuracy is not really that important here. I like approach game. Uh, I like, I'm looking at putting a lot this week. I mean, I'm just looking at putters. Uh, good putters have done here. Well, here, I know it's the most variable stat there is, but I'm still looking for guys who is good with the flat stick. I mean, in the last 12 years, I think uh, 33 of the 42 golfers that finished top three here, uh, we're inside the top 85 or so in strokes gained putting. I think uh, only three golfers in the last, uh, what, 12 events here uh, that won were outside the top 35 or 36 in strokes gained putting. So it seems like putting is a little bit important. But, yeah, what you said, ball striking, especially approaches, uh, putting, uh, those are the main things I'm looking at uh, this week. Maybe a little bit of par four scoring thrown in there as well, along with birdies. Yeah, the there's... I mean, being a par 70, there's an overflow of par fours on the course, and there are five that fall in that 400 to 450 yard range. There's another five, 450 to 500. That's where the good putting really comes in. But on those shorter par fours, you can really attack those. That means guys like Fina, who really suck at putting, can probably still stick it to like, you know, six to 10 feet and make some of those putts for the first time in ages. All five of those holes play below par. So that's where the scoring is going to really come from, along with, you know, an overflow of eagles on the par fives. You mentioned number 18, where I remember two years ago before Justin Thomas won here, he was in there, maybe it was three years ago now. Whenever Justin Thomas burst onto the scene, he was in contention. It was three, yeah, three years ago because Jimmy Walker won that year. When it came down the stretch, I forget if it was Saturday or Sunday, but there's a little like creek before the green on the 18th, and he just jarred it right into it. He ended up taking like a seven on the par five and effectively took himself out of the tournament. But other than that, like hole nine, 36 Eagles last year was the most of any hole on tour. Like, I know I don't really like to factor eagle rate in too much only because, you know, it's almost like putting. It's highly variable because it does rely on putting long irons. There's so much that goes into it that it's not very predictive, but certain guys do see an overflow of eagles on their card throughout the course of the year, like someone like Luke List. Justin Thomas is one of them. I know Brooks isn't here, but he's another one that generates a lot of eagle opportunities. Therefore, he just makes a lot of eagles compared to a lot of different players. So would you be looking at eagle rate at all? Because I've factored it in just a little bit this week. 
I mean, I haven't really looked at it too much. I, I, you know, I put a little bit of into the par five scoring as well. Like you said, it's hard to predict the Eagles. Uh, but I mean, I, I don't have anything against looking at it. You know, I mean, it, it makes sense. And for DraftKings points, I mean, it's it, it's a boon. You know, I mean, you want those Eagles. Those eight points are nice. Yeah, and the scoring has been adjusted on DraftKings as well. Everyone complained for years and years and years and years about, oh, the hole-in-one bonus is just way too much, and you know the Albatross is worth way too much. Those have been actually taken down in terms of points, which I'm pretty happy about because you can't... A hole-in-one is so lucky. It's nice to get a bonus for it, but having a bonus for it where it's 20 points and you effectively win the week if you have the one guy who might get a hole-in-one was kind of ridiculous. I like how the new rules work out. I'm not just saying that because, you know, I'm, a, I'm in partnership with DraftKings. I, I just think it's a really smart move to do. Do you like it? Yeah, I mean, I have no problem with it. What is it, like five points now, I think, right? Yeah, it's five, or, instead, of, it's, it's five instead of 20. Yeah, so I mean, it's still you know, 13 points total if you, you factor in the Eagles, so it's still a hefty amount, so I, I don't mind it. Yeah, well, I mean, it's, it's nice that you would get credit for getting a hole-in-one because it happens so rarely. But, you know, having it decide weeks, like, you have to have this guy in your lineup, basically, if he plays all four rounds versus, hey, this is a nice bonus. This guy still came T46 and finished, like, 20th in DraftKings points, not third for no reason. Yeah, definitely. All right, um, let's move on. Before we get into the field, I actually do want to mention, go to FantasyNational.com, sign up if you want to get a head start. We had a lot of winners last week, a lot of screenshots. you got to love the screenshots, and always send me your screenshots when you win, people. If you watch the show, I mean, I'll, I'll give you the credit you deserve out there, and if you want to credit Fantasy National, even better. It has every tool that you need, you know, stats by round, customizable search ranges, tournament history, a custom stat model, which is super easy to use, a simulator, lineup generator, everything that you need. And the lineup generator is great because you can adjust it after the fact. Like, oh, I have too many shares on this one guy. I want to move them onto this guy. These guys are paired too much in one lineup. I want to separate them where you can just combine all the skill sets or tea times that you want to do. Kenny, you've been using Fantasy National a lot. Do you like it? I do. I'm a huge fan of the, uh, the, the stats that you can put it in, like your own personal stats. Uh, I'm a huge fan of that. I'm looking at it right now on my computer screen, actually. Yeah, I got it pulled up, on, pulled up on the iPad in front of me just so I can reference a few things as we move along here. Plus, it saves all my favorites, and it just makes it a lot easier. We're like, oh, yeah, I don't want to forget about that guy. Make me a little marker. It's just the simplest site to use, and it's the only spot that you need to go. So fantasynational.com, go check it out. Or just follow at Fantasy National on Twitter to see all the content that's coming out of there in terms of stats. There's no, like, giveaway, like, hey, pick this guy, pick this guy. It's up to you to figure that out, but it's the most customized tool you'll find on the interweb, so you might want to check it out. Let's get into the field. Top three players, all above $10,000. We got Speed. We got defending champ Justin Thomas. Then we have Mark Leishman. Um, I actually think that people are going to go with Spieth more than people think. Right now, per Fantasy National, he's the projected highest owned of these top five guys. Uh, he lost almost four strokes putting last week on the greens, which is atypical of Jordan Spieth, to say the least, considering he's one of the best putters in the world, especially when he's on. Putts better on bent than Bermuda. I mean, that's... That goes without saying. However, uh, I actually like Spieth the best out of these three guys, although I think there's a sneaky case you can make for Mark Leishman right now because he was disastrous around the greens last week. However, uh, that doesn't really come into play too much here. It's all about irons, and he was second in strokes gained approach at Kapalua. Yeah, you know, I'm with you on Spieth. If I had to rank these three, I'm going Spieth, Leishman, and, and JT when it comes down to it. Uh, his speed, his iron play, his around the green play, just, you know, I know the around the green play is not that important, but if the wind picks up, you know, the greens are small. Uh, you never know what the weather really is going to do. Right now it says it's going to be calm. But, uh, you know, if it picks up, you know, maybe that around the green will be uh, a little bit more important. He's the best iron player out there right now. And I'm looking hard at irons, iron play and approaches and everything, all that good stuff. You know, great proximity from 150 to 175 yards, really good par four scoring from 400 to 450. Like you said, you dominate those holes. Uh, that's where the scoring comes from. So it's hard not to overlook Spieth. I mean, you're definitely going to use, I'm definitely going to use him a bunch. Uh, Leishman makes sense. I mean, like you said last week, um, you know, he had the one bad round. I think he shot a 76 on, on Saturday and that sort of uh, dampened his chances, even though he still finished, I think what top five, top seven, something like that. So he still had a good performance. Um, I do like him. I like him a lot this year for, Bigger tournaments. I think Leishman's going to have a big year. I think maybe majors, uh, you know, has a chance for a major this year. So I do like Leish as well. Uh, uh, JT? Yeah. What do you think about JT? Well, the thing about JT is I, I don't really have a good grasp on what he's up to. Like, 
I always like to see him more like a form guy. I know he, he spiked randomly in the past as well, but like, hey, he's the defending champ. Uh, but no one's really giving him much of a shot here to win, despite the fact that his odds are below 10 to 1. Like, he and Spieth are the very clear co-favorites. But when I look at it, and just the people that I've talked to so far, and even generating my own lineups, that I just find him hard to work in. Like, I would rather pay up a little bit more for Spieth, and I don't see a big downgrade going to Leishman. But I guess the question is, does this mean Justin Thomas is going to go wildly under-owned? Like, is Kevin Kisner going to be higher owned than Justin Thomas? Yeah, we were talking about that on the pod last night. I mean, the worry I have with Justin Thomas is, you know, he, his, his caddy, Jimmy Johnson, uh, has some type of uh, illness. So he hasn't been He wasn't there last week. He's not going to be here this week. I know Bones McKay is going to be uh, caddying for JT this week. It's uh, Phil Mickelson's old caddy. You know, a lot of these younger guys, they they rely on their caddies a lot. I mean, you see it with Spieth and Greller. Uh, you know, even JT has said how much Jimmy Johnson has helped him uh, with his game and stuff. And so losing that part of his game – I think it's a little bit bigger deal for especially for these younger guys who rely on their caddies so much. And I think it makes a little bit of a big difference. Uh, but we were talking about his ownership. You know, if he's like 11, 10, 12 percent, I mean, it's, you know, if you play 70 to 100 lineups, if you're a mass multi and uh, during, you know, lineup type player, you know, it might be prudent to use him at 20 percent because you're going to be overweight. And, you know, the upside, of course, is great with Justin Thomas. Well, right now, I'm looking at the Fantasy National ownership projections based on... That's one of the great things about having a membership at Fantasy National is that it kind of aggregates everyone who's a member, puts that into a thing, and tries to spit out calculations based on who people are actually picking and putting in their lineups. Uh, but Justin Thomas right now has a projected ownership percentage of 16%. That will change over the next day. FanshareSports.com is also very good at tracking where the ownership is going to rest. But... I, it just seems like he's going to be the odd man out of these top three. And I, I think that makes him a viable GPP play. But I, still, like, I'm not going to be playing 75 to 100 lineups. I'm probably going to play like 20 lineups. And then I get into the decision where do I expand my core to the point where I want to include Justin Thomas or just have more speed or potentially more Leishman, that kind of thing. And I, I think I'm more leaning towards fading Justin Thomas. And if that's the case, it probably means he's going to win. Yeah, no, I hear you on that. I mean, the thing is, if you're not making a bunch of lineups, if you're only making a couple, uh, he's definitely, you know, he's my least favorite out of the three, even though ownership-wise it could be a, uh, you know, a generous thing for the, to have him just in case he does pull it off, which, of course, he has talent too. Uh, I want to run through, based on the past 24 rounds, and this is something you can find again at FantasyNational.com, the top 10 in terms of strokes gained approach in this tournament based on these players last 24 rounds. So right now, number one is Ryan Armour, Stuart Sink, Gary Woodland, Spieth, Kevin Na, Justin Thomas, Tyron Von Aswagen. Then you have Mark Leishman, JJ Spawn, and Scott Piercy. That's an interesting group. Uh, and all three of the top ranked players fall in there, but we don't see any Brian Harmon. We don't see any Kevin Kisner. And those are the next two and still above $10,000 players. I actually like Kevin Kisner here. Uh, he's good with long irons. He's good with his, I mean, he's just good on par fours in general. And he's the number one player in the field over the past 36 rounds on par fours from 400 to 450 yards. Plus, he's a great Bermuda putter when it comes down to it. I'm going to lean Kisner over Harmon, uh, and that's after I was on all over Harmon last week, and he, and he too puts really well on Bermuda. Do you have a decision to make between those two guys, or are you just dropping down to the next range? You know, uh, last night, I definitely, on the podcast, I definitely talked about how I like Kisner a little bit better than Harmon, but I dug a little bit deeper when it came to Harmon. Brian Harmon crushes these greens. Uh, you know, in the last three years he's played this tournament, he's, like, he's getting like almost 19 strokes on the field with his putter. Uh, so obviously, like I said earlier, you know, I'm looking at good putters here this week. He sort of fits the bill when it comes down to it. I mean, 19 strokes gained in his last three tournaments is sort of sick. Uh, and, you know, his approach game is not great, but he did show some form with his irons last week, gaining, what, 5.2 strokes on the field with his approaches. Um, if he can continue that iron play and putt like he has been, here at Sony, he's super comfortable on these greens. It sort of definitely looks like And Even though the greens are smaller and they're not quite as large and as undulated as they were last week at Kapalua, these aren't the easiest greens to putt on. You know, There's some tricky little breaks here and there when it comes down to it. So uh, I, I like Harmon. Uh, I think Harmon's actually probably going to be my second favorite play when it comes to these five top five golfers on top. And it, it, it's a jump from – he was fourth last night. And so – I did a little bit of uh, more research on him, and just that putting stat just really 
open my eyes about him. And it's a lot of strokes gained. He's comfortable here. Uh, so I think Harmon's one of my – I like Harmon better than Kisner, even though – but I'll use Kisner because I make uh, uh, so many lineups. Well, the, the weird thing about Harmon is, despite the fact that he finished so well last week and was being talked up around the industry, even his his ownership went under what I thought it was going to be. And just looking at the early projections in terms of ownership, he factors to be the lowest owned of these top five guys. So maybe he's the pivot play that you want. I thought recency bias would really play into this, where, hey, it's Brian Harmon coming off a good week. And you know this now he's back at a course that really suits him well. But it doesn't seem like people are going that direction. Yeah, I mean, I'm cool with that because I think he's probably going to be my second highest owned guy when it comes up to these top five guys up top uh, behind speed. So I'm all for it. Uh, just to factor in your putting stats just a little bit, uh, I, I sorted by just YLI numbers when it came to putting and who's gained the most strokes here over per round over the past six years. And the top ten reads out like this. Russell Henley, Charles Howell III, Jerry Kelly, 50-year-old Jerry Kelly. Good for him, making his... Or maybe it's J.J. Henry. Jerry Kelly, J.J. Henry. Yeah, I think Jerry Kelly's the one making his 500th career start on tour. Colt Nost, Jimmy Walker, Jamie Lovemark, da points. Mark Leishman, Mackenzie Hughes. And then it's a tie for 10th with Justin Thomas and Brian Harmon. So per round, these guys are absolutely destroying it on these greens. If you look down at the bottom, guys that like suck at putting at the Sony Open, and the samples aren't huge for some of these guys. Sometimes it's six rounds, sometimes it's 14 round. But guys that just have really struggled on these greens, notable guys. Wee Kim has been terrible here. KJ Choi and Kyle Stanley have been terrible here over the past six years. Finau, Berger, Ryan Blom, Patrick Rogers, and Sam Saunders have also fallen in the bottom 5% in terms of strokes game putting per round at this event. So I thought that was somewhat interesting to figure in because I want to talk about Tony Finau. I love Tony Finau this week. And I understand that he comes with the risk of he can't putt. And we all kind of know that. But I think his ball striking is just so good off the top anyway that if he just putts around field average, he doesn't need to gain six strokes putting. He's going to gain all of the strokes everywhere else. But short par fours, he crushes them. Par fives, absolutely annihilates them. When you talk about guys that can get eagles, he is one of them. I just need not him. I need for him not to lose four strokes on the green. And I think he comes inside the top five. So at eighty nine hundred bucks, I think he's a steal. Yeah, I'm a huge fan of Fina this week, especially you know with Charles Howell III being right underneath him. You know, Cam Smith has been popular lately, and you got Berger and Xander right around him as well. I'm not going to say he's going to be overlooked because he's become a popular DFS play, but he could be a little bit less owned than you know than people think. And, and you know, the thing is, you think about Tony Finau as a bomber who you want to use on bombing type courses, and this course is not necessarily that type of course. You know, it's sort of a, a you know thin fairways. It's not like I said, it's pretty hard to hit these fairways. But you look at courses. You, know, you look at the last year at Tony Finau. He's been playing these courses that don't seem to fit him fairly well. I mean, what, 7th of Valero, 5th uh, of the Canadian, 7th of the Tour Championship. I mean, he finished 29th of the Quicken Loans. It doesn't sound great uh, at TPC Potomac, but, I mean, I was at that course, and that course is definitely not something that I thought Tony Finau would succeed at with those, you know, with all the trouble and the, and the tight fairways and the small greens. And he finished a respectable 29th there as well. So he's sort of become more of a complete package uh, when it comes to his game on tour. Uh, I expect big things from him this year. I expect big things from him this week. I'm with you on Fiena for GPPs. All right, so the rest of the guys in that range, when we look at it, I think that Russell Henley, just by, you know, I just mentioned he's the number one in putting at this course over the past six years. He won his first tour event at the Sony Open, and he's coming off a pretty good weekend at Kapalua. I think that people are really going to be on him, but I love Zach Johnson here. He, too, is a former winner. It was almost a decade ago, but he does have three top tens in his past four starts at this course and he's been playing really well sneakily under the radar throughout this swing season a lot better than he had been doing throughout the course of his well i don't say throughout the course of his career but throughout the course of last season where he kind of struggled a very good par five score when his wedges are on because you know he's he's not really attacking a lot of these greens into although the par five ninth is short enough that he can get there into but his putting has been absolutely lights out so if you do look at his putting he's gained strokes off the tee and through approaches in three consecutive events and he's the number one putter in the field over the past 24 rounds i think he's going to go under the radar maybe that's just me because i feel like people don't like zach johnson it seems like it's a lot of money at 9500 dollars. but if everyone's going to take henley or webb simpson just give me zj and i'll be on my way yeah i mean zach johnson last night i started uh, i used to do a video where i did my cash game cornerstones it was like my four favorite cash game plays 
still and then if you use those four golfers that I picked, it still lets you around fifteen thousand dollars under the cap on DraftKings. And Zach Johnson was my first pick. I definitely like him this week. Love him for cash. Uh, I'm going to be on him just like you. I actually like Webb Simpson a little bit better, and he was my second cash game cornerstone pick last night on the Fantasy Golf Journalist podcast. Uh, the thing about Webb. You know, he had that withdrawal last time, but it wasn't due to an injury. I think his father was ill, so you don't have to worry about that with him. But when it comes to ball striking, you know, Tita Green, he's always solid. His nemesis has always been his putter. But, you know, in the last few months, he switched to the Kuchar, you know, long putter, left-hand high type putting grip, and he's been putting well. Yes, Webb Simpson has been putting well. Uh, In the last 50 rounds, he's actually 12th in this field in strokes being putting, 12th. Out of 144 golfers, Webb Simpson in the last 50 rounds, which is shocking because you can see that if he gets that putter going, his tee to green game is so solid that he should be up there this week. It is, and it's shocking because he's not great off the tee. He's going to hit a lot of fairways, but again, that doesn't really matter here. You can venture off the short grass and still be able to hit a lot of greens in regulation. And you mentioned he's 12th over the past 50. He's 14th over the past 24 rounds as well on the greens, which it it almost makes my brain explode trying to think about it. But yeah, it's shocking that he hasn't put it all together now that he's putting so well. I'm just not a huge Webb fan. I think that if I'm going to concentrate my ownership for my lineups at least in that area, that I'm going to go to Zach Johnson or I'm going to go bit down to Tony Finau. And I do want to talk about some of these guys in the $8,000 range as well because you mentioned Charles Howell III. I think he's going to be very popular. Obviously, based on his course history here, he's someone that just finishes inside the top 10 almost every single season. Uh, he just never wins because Charles Howell III is allergic to winning. But I look at Berger right below him. Berger I just ran through the guys that have not putted well at this course in the past, and Berger was one of them inside the bottom 5% in terms of strokes game per round, a big old negative. But I just see $8,700. He played well last week despite being Andercursed. Uh, he just seems too cheap. He seems like he's $1,000 too cheap in this field. Yeah, I agree. And the thing about Charles Howell is he's going to be popular. But you look at the talent surrounding him with Finau, Berger, Xander. I mean, those three guys can win. And they're right around price with him. You know, usually I'm a chalk guy. This week, I might be fading Charles Howell III just because, you know, everything lines up for him here. You know, 11 uh, top 15 or 12 top 15s and 16 tries. He's made all 16 of his cuts here. The correlated courses, he's been doing well. I mean, OHL, I know Mayakoba, people talk about a correlated course. He had a top 10 finish there recently. Um, you know, he did well, again, like I said earlier, at TPC Potomac, uh, even though it's a little bit more difficult course than it is this week. But in other short par 70 type course with tight fairways. Um, but I, he just doesn't win. <laughs> and like the other three guys around him, I think Finau can win. I think Burr can win. I think Xander can win. I think Cam Smith can win. It's just it just seems like the, the, where he's priced and the golfers around Charles Howe that makes me want to not use him this week. Well, you mentioned Xander. We know he can win. Won twice last year on tour. He's switching over to the new irons. You know, didn't play all that well at Kapalua last week. I think that his overall finish was you know, much better than the stats that he ended up producing because uh, he was all over the place. Now, maybe he's used to the irons, and that's no longer a factor. But no one is owning Xander this week. Based on the projections, he is the lowest owned. He and Si Wu, two guys that we know can both win. But I think I would rather go Si Wu over Xander, although I never like taking Si Wu on drafting. He's more of an outright bet play for me because I know that his win equity is so high, but I feel like, you know, he's still more likely to withdraw than he is to win. Yeah, I mean, the problem I have is see, it's hard. You, you don't see him do the back-to-back thing that often. He played pretty well last week. He's just the type of guy who pops out of the nowhere. I agree with you. When it comes to betting, I mean, it seems like a safer per- thing to go with Siwoo and DraftKings. You just don't know what you're going to get, you know? I mean, it's tough to, to hit that draft button on Siwoo, uh, especially at this price. You know, if he was like 6,800, 7,300, well, then, yeah, you know, you, you take that chance uh, because you can fit so many more studs up top. But, I mean, it's a pretty big chunk right there, $8,500. Uh, the rest of the guys in this range below Siwoo, you got William McGirt, Ollie Schneider, Jans, Bill Haas, Jamie Lovemark, Shez Reeve, and Emiliano Grillo. I think a lot of people might gravitate towards Ollie. Don't think anyone's going to own Bill Haas. But the guys that I like, I love Shez Reeve. I think he's in a great spot. I think that Shez Reeve is just an incredibly underrated player. 
and he just doesn't have the name cache, therefore the ownership never skyrockets out of control. And with the way that you do roster construction this week, if you take one of the super expensive guys above $11,000 and you still want to get a Tony Finau, a Berger, a Cam Smith, or a Henley, it's just really hard to drop into this range for your next guy. So I think that Chez Revy goes wildly under owned. Like he should be a 20% player. He probably comes in around 12%. I really like how he sets up here. He's going to be in a lot of my lineups, a core player for me. But the other guy that I'm pivoting on to in this range, I don't think anyone's going to take. And he ranked number one in my stats model that I generated from fantasynational.com is William McGirt. And at his peak, I mean, you know, you're around the D.C. area. He won Memorial one year. He can score on par fours when he gets going. He's good with those long irons. He has a hot putter in his hand from time to time. He's playing a little bit better recently. I just don't think anyone's going to own McGirt. And, you know, based on the quality of players around him, I know Ollie is a sexier name, but McGirt still might be a better player. Yeah, no, I mean, we're thinking alike here this week there, Pat. Chez is one of my favorite plays this week. The guy's just super consistent, you know? I mean, you know, in the last half month, I mean, he's been one of the – or last half year, he's been one of the most consistent DFS golfers out there. I mean, last eight events, seven top 25s. In my rankings, he's the only golfer this week to be uh, inside the top 12 in the field in both strokes game approach and strokes game putting during the last 50 rounds. And it's really not even close. There's no one else even near it. I think he's like 12th in putting and 8th in approach or something like that when it comes down to uh, his last 50 rounds in the field here. Uh, so I love the Reeve call. I'm going to be using a lot of them. I'll be using them in cash. And I do love the McGirt call. He was one of my sleeper plays uh, I talked about uh, last night on the Fantasy Golf Generous pod. He has good form coming in. Always, you know, his putter's been hot lately. His iron play was his, sort of his downfall when he had a little bit of a skid when it came to like the middle of the last season, but it seems like it's trending upwards. He's gained strokes um, with his irons in four of his last five events played. So I do like that call a lot. And I think he's going to go under look. Uh, I do like McGirt. All right, in the $7,000 area, I screwed it up on the show I did on Monday with Feinberg, which everyone can go back and watch if they like. But I was hyping up Chris Stroud, but I meant to be hyping up Brian Stewart. It was Brian Stewart who has a good course history here, not Chris Stroud. Stroud was just in my mind because he had played last week. But Brian Stewart is another one who I think is a nice pivot play because no one's going to own him at like 7800 bucks. But he sets up really well and just does really well at Sony year after year that there has to be something to it, doesn't there? Yeah, I mean, you know, what what, what did he win? He win uh, he won in New Orleans what a couple of years ago, right? If I'm not mistaken, that's sort of a sort of a plotters type course, a strategic type course like it is uh, this week. So I mean, yeah, I, I never I didn't really think of him that much, but I mean, it doesn't make sense. Uh, I like Brian Gay a little bit, uh, you know, a hundred dollars above uh, Brian Stewart. You, you know, the, again, the putting aspect is something that I've been looking at a little bit more, and Gay's always been a good putter. Uh, but, you know, his last time out at the RSN, he gained seven strokes on the field with his approaches. So he can come out with those iron plays like he had been in his last tournament, you know, and putt like he usually does. Uh, I think he can make a little bit of a, a mark this week. I can see with Brian Gay, but I think just so much of his production is factored into his putting. Like at the RSM, he has a really good course history at the RSM. There's something about Sea Island that he has figured out. And I don't know if he has that at the Sony Open like year after year. So I've been hearing Brian Gay's name talked up a lot this week. He's someone that I'm going to avoid. I'd rather just take a few less shares of Brian Stewart and then just drop down to JJ Spawn and push all in. That's, that's my move this week. Yeah, I'm a fan of Spawn. I mean, he's one of the hotter players out there. He had an awesome fall. Uh, looks like one of those younger guys who's primed to break out. It's sort of like Austin Cook uh, a little bit as well. I mean, he, he he was popular last week, and he started off really strong, but he sort of faded it towards the end. I think a lot of people are going to overlook Austin Cook, and you got to remember his looper is Kip Henley, who was Brian Gay's old caddy. Um, and they, they, you know, he has a lot of experience here um, at uh, – wild eyes so that i think that could be helpful for austin cook this week i mean he's been putting out of his mind he makes a ton of birdies uh so i'm a fan of him as well uh but i do like spawn a lot this week just because that form is there a win is coming for him uh, i'll probably be riding him until that happens 
Yeah, I'm doing the exact same thing. I'm just going to keep taking JJ's spawn until he wins, and then he probably peters out just a little bit. But, you know, at, at 7600 bucks, he's third tee to green over the past 24 rounds. He's eighth in strokes game, ball striking. He's 10th in approach. He's scoring on par fours and par fives alike. Like, everything seems to be lining up that he ends up being, like, the chalky bust of the week. But I don't even know how chalky he's going to be because everyone in this range, I feel like, is going to do what's a very sensible thing to do. Look at the betting odds compared to the draft. DraftKings price, be on your way, and you're like, oh my god, Gary Woodland's 33-1, to 1, and he's less than $8,000. I just don't see how people get away from using Gary Woodland in this range. And I don't know if I'm going to go full fade on Gary Woodland, but I will be massively underweight compared to the field. Yeah, I mean, Woodland has that good approach game. He has pretty good history here. Awesome tee the green game. Pretty good from 175 to 200 yards as well so i mean i can definitely understand it i'll probably be using it but just going back to spawn i mean his main catalyst is going to be his putting i mean if you look back at his i think he had like five top fives uh you know in the last 12 months or so all of them occurred when he gained more than four strokes putting so you know if he gets that putter hot he's going to contend that's what it's going to come down with spawn with him, i got no problem with he's sort of like a senile light to me uh, a guy who's a bomber but sort of has played better uh, at courses that you normally wouldn't think that Woodland would be able to play well at. Uh, I'm not going to be on a full fade like you. I'll probably be eating some of that chalk. Yeah, I mean, I don't know if I'm, I haven't decided whether I'm going to go full fade or not, but like if I, I'm projecting him right now to be somewhere between 20 and 25%, he is the next logical drop down guy after you take the big two when people are constructing lineups. So I, instead of going, I might just own like 10% or 5% just to have a share. But I, I'm really, I am considering going full fade at this point, just to be like, hey, what's the difference between owning zero and 5%? I'm still going to be so massively underweight that if Gary Woodland wins, my lineups probably aren't looking all that strong. Yeah, I can definitely see that. The other guy who's down in the low $7,000 area coming off a really good week where he gained almost seven strokes or six strokes putting on the field, which is very atypical of his performance, is Jason Duffner. He just, again, he's another guy who's 45 to 1 in the betting odds, and he's priced down with guys that are 175 to 1. Uh, I, I don't mind Jason Duffner here, but again, I can see him being so chalky that he seems really easy to get away from because there are other players down in that range, and even below $7,000 that I I like just as much i mean i'll be eating that chalk more than probably woodland just because you know I mean, he's the ninth highest ranked golfer in the field and the 39th highest price golfer in the field uh he had a good performance last week when, when you talk about his putting uh you know last year was actually his best putting year since 2012 uh first time he's been inside the top 100 in strokes game putting for a year since 2012 it's definitely something that he's been working on. And his approach game's always solid. Uh, so I do like Duffner, especially in cash. You know, you could definitely, I can definitely see the fade when it comes down to Duffner in GPPs because he's going to be super, super high owned. But in cash, it's definitely, I'm probably going to eat the chalk in, uh, in, in GPPs just as well. Just because he's so cheap, I think he's going to be a steady option and it's going to help you be able to afford, you know, some of these higher priced golfers. If you're looking for a pivot, I mean, what do you think of Kyle Stanley at this uh, range? I don't mind Kyle Stanley. I want to see him heat up a little bit first. I, I don't think that he's a guy who goes from cold to hot just like that. I think that you naturally see his progression coming a little bit, and I don't think that he's there right now. But I think for cash games, and I'm going to be using these guys in GPPs too, let's not get it twisted, but Ryan Armour and Stuart Sink below $7,000 seem very safe to me. Yeah, Armour armor, armor especially. I think, and I think Armour's going to be a little bit overlooked. I think Sink's going to be popular. Uh, Sink's probably going to be the highest owned guy under seven thousand dollars this week, in my opinion. But I like Armor at, at sixty nine hundred. I mean, the guy had a great fall with that win. Uh, he, he showed out a little bit. I mean, I think he only finished twentieth place, but respectable showing last week at the Tournament of Champions. Good iron player. Uh, you know, good to the green. I think he's first in good drive percentage uh, in his last fifty rounds in this field. You're not going to hit these fairways all the time. So, I mean, that makes sense to me. Top 10 in proximity from 150 to 175 yards. I mean, it just makes a lot of sense with armor. 
Uh, to swing back up to the $7,000 range, the upper tier, yeah, Peter Uline sitting right there, a DFS favorite and a Pat Mayo favorite. Luke List is only $7,500. Bucks. I, I don't think there's a way you could talk me out of him. I, apparently, I'm just taking the worst putters in the world, putting them on all my teams this week. <laughs> but but Uline, List, Keegan Bradley's right there too, and he's been playing a little bit better. Do you have a preference between those three guys? Because it's List for me. I, I just think that right now, based on his performance, I know Uline has upside, but I think that people are more enamored with the fact that he could be the next Brooks Kepka, only because he was an American playing on the European tour and now he's coming over. Now, they might be right. He could be the next Brooks Kepka, but you know, I, I want to see something first here. Like People are already talking about him like he is Brooks Kepka. Yeah, I mean, I need a little bit more from Uline. I, I know he has the talent. Uh, you know, we've seen the talent play in this last uh, few months that he, we've seen him uh, on the European tour and on, on this tour a little bit. Um, you know, out of those three, I'm probably with you on list. I mean, I, I'm a I'm a Keegan fan. Uh, maybe just to, to rub it into my co-host uh, face a little bit. I know Brad, who's my co-host, uh, Brad Messersmith, my co-host on the Fantasy Golf Generous Pod, hates Keegan. So <laughs> that could be a little bit of a reason why I sort of ride Keegan sometimes. But I do like list. He should dominate these par fives. He hits a ton of birdies. His approach game is pretty decent. I mean, I think he's like 24th out of the 144 in the field in his last 50 rounds with his approach shots. But, you know, I think he should be able to crush these par fives and make a ton of birdies on the short par fours. I want to talk about GPP flyers, pivot plays, sleepers, some of these guys that you can get into your lineups at very low ownership, and you don't need to own a ton of them either. If you're playing mass multi-entries, then you know you can own 5%, 10% if you really want to go crazy and go overweight on the situation. But guys that I like, I like Jason Kokrak as a pivot play off Gary Woodland. Similar skill set. It's going to be like one-tenth the ownership, maybe one-twelfth, and he's cheaper. Uh, I know he's not as consistent and you know doesn't have the pedigree of Gary Woodland, but we've seen Jason co crack spike in the past i like him no one's really talking about kevin na but you know a shorter par 70 where irons come into play sounds like a kevin na course so i'm going to be on him seamus power just rates out really well when it comes to ball striking and putting he's only 7200 dollars chris kirk is someone who got you know he folded against jimmy walker a few years ago but his game is slightly turning back around a little bit and when chris kirk is at his peak he is an excellent iron player and he can putt a little bit too do you like chris kirk here uh, he was going to be my sleeper pick. Uh, you sort of took my wind on that one. You know, he switched. He's one of the few golfers that actually switched out of PXG. Uh, he was a PXG guy uh, last year, and he actually stopped using them. And he has a mixed bag last time I looked. A whole bunch of uh, different types of irons and woods and you know uh, hybrids in his bag. But it looked like it helped him out. Uh, he had a really nice performance when it came at the uh, last tournament he played at. I don't know if I can bring it up. Well, he finished fourth at the RSM looked really solid with his irons. And he, like you said, he can putt. I mean, his iron play is what definitely uh, caught my eye, gaining strokes uh, with his irons in the last five tournaments he played. So, yeah, I like Kirk. It seems like his game's turning around. He's a sleeper that I like uh, in this range. I sort of like um, Andrew Landry a little bit at $7,000. The guy has skill. You remember a few years ago he was leading the U.S. Open after day one. Um, he has a lot of skill, a younger guy, good talent. Uh, I think uh, he's definitely someone I'm looking at here uh, at the low $7,000 range as well. Yeah, so, I mean, I stole one of your sleepers. You're going to steal one of mine. I, too, like Andrew Landry. He's uh, he's someone that the Fantasy National Golf Simulator, Win Simulator, liked a lot compared to a lot of the different players in this range. But the one that I like the most at $7,000, it's Aaron Wise. Like, I'm just going with pedigree on this one. He's the NCAA individual champion from a few years back. He grinded out on the McKenzie Tour. He earned his card. And he's played inconsistently, but we've seen flashes of his upside over the course of the swing season. I just think that... You know, instead of taking some of the flyers at higher prices, I think this is a very good range to use Aaron Wise in, and hopefully that this is the week that he can kind of break through. And I think that it's going to come for him at some point this year. I don't think that he's Patrick Cantley-esque, because what Patrick Cantley achieved last year was kind of incredible. But if he can even be like 70% of that, uh, then he's going to be wildly undervalued for a while. So I want to get on the bandwagon right now before it's completely full and he just becomes chalk every week. Yeah, I mean, there's a couple of guys like that in that range. I mean, you got Aaron Wise, you got Bo Hostler, uh, another guy coming off, uh, you know, a good college career. Uh, I, I got a question for you, though. If his name was, let's say, Doug Smith, do you think people would be as into Bo Hostler just because his name is Bo Hostler? It's a cool name. I, I mean, I, I guess the big thing about me and Bo Hostler is 
his performance at the uh, NCAA championship a couple of years ago when he like broke his collarbone or something. He like he was really messed up, and he wanted to go out there and keep playing. I mean, I sort of like that heart. I sort of like that drive. Uh, that was the big thing that sort of got me in to Bo Hostler and, you know, a good putter, you know, decent putter, at least recently. Uh, he, he didn't do that well at the RSM prior to that. He'd been putting lights out. He had a decent fall, a couple of top tens uh, when it comes down to it. I, I think my bias on him is watching him through the NCAA championship. I mean, that was some courageous stuff because he had to play. If he withdrew, his team would lose, you know? And so he tried to stick it out basically with one arm. Uh, and so – that's sort of my bias when it comes to Bo Hostler. And that's why I sort of like him and I like playing him. I and mean, probably not the best strategy when it comes to DFS, you know, rostering a guy just because you watched him do something amazing two years ago. But we are here. Uh, another guy, I mean, I know uh, Jeff talked about it a little bit. Uh, ben Silverman, $6,800. Another young guy who seems like, you know, his game is suited for the PGA Tour. And a couple of top tens again in the fall. What do you think about Silverman? He putts. I mean, that, that's been really the crux of his results so far. Again, another very popular guy in the Fantasy National Win Simulator, and he has been throughout the course of the swing season, and it's really paid dividends if you were just kind of blindly taking him based off that. He's churned out great results. I don't really know what to make of him, to tell you the truth, like besides putting near elite almost every single week that he's been on tour. I can't really tell you what else he does well. I mean, he did gain, like, what, six and, a, six and a half strokes on the field at Sanderson Farm. So, you know, if he wanted to, that iron play is definitely out there. But, yeah, his putting is definitely what stuck out to me. And, like I said, you know, I like good, better putters this week. It's not it's not normal for me. Usually putting is, like, one of the least stats that I look at. Uh, this week I definitely bumped it up a little bit. So I mentioned Armour and Sink is two guys that I feel very confident about below the $7,000 threshold. And then I think that you could use those guys in cash games if you really wanted to. And you can still sprinkle them into GPPs because outside of Sink, Armour is not going to have super high ownership like you mentioned. However, the other guys I just want to take like a one or two share flyer on. One is Tyler Duncan, another one who's just a great ball striker. He too rates out really well in terms of the simulation. Uh, ben Silverman, I will be taking a few shots on just because, like you said, if it comes down to putting... We know that the guy can putt, and everyone else seems to be on him, so I might as well join in the fray with that one as well. The other two guys, Ryan Blom, good ball striker, and Taylor Gooch, good ball striker, at least recently over the past three events. So those are two guys, just based on some of the, you know, the par four ranges, beyond 200 proximity, generating eagles for themselves. Those are two guys that aren't great players by any stretch of the imagination, but I do think that they could do well enough to make the cut this week. And if they do make the cut, their games are tailored for higher draft King's scoring. So even if he just own 5%, the field is going to own like 1% of these guys. So I'm just going to be a little bit overweight on them. Yeah, when it comes down to these $6,000 golfers, I mean, you're normally not, you might see like one guy above 10%. You know, these guys are basically going to be lower owned. My strategy usually comes down to, uh, you know, I never, I, I never use any golfer less than 10%. Uh, I, you know, I make it a point to use every golfer that in my that I roster, I usually roster around thirty to thirty-five golfers in my seventy lineups. Uh, I, I I make it a point that I have to roster the golfers at least ten percent. So you know when it comes down to these six K range, I use a, a good handful of these guys. You know a lot of the times I'll I'll piggyback off other you know you know smart guys out there like yourself uh, and, and Jeff and uh, some other people in uh and I'll I'll use a good handful, maybe like eight of these guys seven of these guys down here just so I can, you know, have a little bit of leeway when it comes down to building my lineups. And I always use them more than 10%. I use them at least 10%. So more than likely I'm always over uh, the field average, you know, when it comes down to their ownership. So that's my strategy when it comes down to these $6,000 golfers. Uh, another player down in this range that the numbers really like, but I can never get a feel for is Von Taylor. And just when it comes to ball striking, when it comes to iron play, he can get so hot and he's relatively consistent with it. But somehow that never really translates to really high finishes, except for that one week at Pebble when he bested Phil on 18, when Phil missed like a three inch putt because he's Phil and that's what he does. He can't win. But Vaughn Taylor is someone that I'm just going to blindly use at like five. I'm not afraid to play. I will use a few more guys in the $6,000 area, but instead of using people at 10%, I'll use them at 5%. Just give myself more mixing and matching because I do really try to consolidate my core players up at the top a little bit more yeah yeah well i mean i i am the type of guy who doesn't use 
a player more than fifty percent either. So I have okay. a little bit of leeway when it comes down to it. Uh, you know, I don't use a guy more than fifty percent. I don't use a guy less than ten percent. That's my strategy when it comes to GPPs. But Von Taylor, yeah, we talked about him on the pod last night. We basically said the same thing. We don't know what we're going to get for him, but he pops uh, when it comes to numbers. Uh, decent top 10 his last time out. Looked great with his irons. Um, you know, and yeah, I'll be using him. Final guy to talk about. $7,200. Jimmy Walker returns to the scene of the crime. I mean, he's won this tournament twice, has been excellent in Hawaii over the years. Uh, you know, he's suffering from Lyme disease, and he has just not been good since that happened, especially his last three times on the course where he's just been a negative in every single statistical category. Is Jimmy Walker someone that you're going to go with on blind faith? Because you know that skill set wise, he's much better than this price, than his odds, and everyone else around him in this range. Or do you think that it's just best to leave him be until he shows any sign of turning it around? I mean, not a single top 10 in the last 12 months. It's tough to roster. I know name value's there. He did win that major a couple of years ago, but I can't roster him when he looks this poor. Is it worth taking, like, I did this at the RSM, I think it was. I forget which one of the swing season tournaments it was, and I just blindly used Bubba Watson. And it didn't really turn out all that well. But just based on what I know his upside can be. And I don't think that, it, like, do you think a lot of people will use Jimmy Walker this week just based on name value and price, even if it's your more casual player? And they think, hey, Jimmy Walker, I know him. He seems cheap. I'll use him. I don't know. With Duffner only $100 above him, I think Duffner's going to sort of carry most of that. Uh, ownership weight in that price range. So you don't think it's just worth it to take a shot on Jimmy whatsoever? I'm out for for the record. I'm going to be full fade on Jimmy Walker, but I'm really curious to get every gauge everyone's interest level in him. No, I mean the game's not there for me to use him. Okay. Finally, let's talk about our core players of the week. We'll give three or four guys that we're going to be using a lot of lineups. Kenny, I'll go first. I'm going to be using a ton of Spieth. I'm going to be using a ton of Zach Johnson. I'll be using a ton of Tony Fino, and I'll have a lot of Chez Revy and JJ Spawn in my lineup. So those are going to be like my five core guys, and I'll mix and match around them. Try to foster in some pivot plays, even off of Spawn. If I use them on like 60% of my lineups, fine. Two or three guys right around them to use around 10% that I think that are going to be low owned. But those are the five guys for me. Who are you really looking at as your core players uh, here? I, you know, I'm going Spieth and Harmon up top. Those are two guys I like. I'm going to use a lot of Webb. Uh, you know, that putting is just getting so much better. And I think, you know, another win could be in the forecast for Webb if he keeps that putting up. Uh, Finau, just like you. Revy, just like you. Duffner. Those are my five or six top guys that I'm going to roster a bunch of this week. Yeah, I think I'm going to use a lot of Ryan Armour and Chris Kirk as well. I'll probably split their ownership in half. So instead of going like 50%, 25 each. But I do think that'll be massively overweight to the field on those two guys from the lower ranges as well. And Aaron Wise. Yeah, on, Don't forget I'm about Aaron Wise. <laughs> big on Kirk, big on Armour. I'm, I'm totally in agreement with you. All right, cool. Kenny Kim. Check him out on the Fantasy Golf Degenerates and at PowerHourPod.com. Kenny, what do you guys got coming up this week? Uh, you know, the Fantasy Golf Degenerates, we just did our 100th podcast. So, I mean, it's pretty incredible stuff that we've made it this long for two plus years. Uh, the PowerHourPod.com, uh, my article's up there this week. Uh, you can go check it out and, you know, the same old stuff. A lot of winners coming from the PowerHourPod.com. I've just seen a lot of screenshots of like, not just like, hey, I won 300 bucks this week. It's like, oh, I won 20 grand this week. So keep up the good work over there. Shout out to Ryan Hodge, too. I know you're not watching, but shout out to you. Love Ryan Hodge. I'm a fan of his, too. Uh, you can follow Kenny on Twitter at Kendo, capital V, capital T. The characters don't need to be capitalized, but it just visually helps you find all that out. You can follow me at the PME on Twitter. And remember, subscribe to the Pat Mayo Experience on the DraftKings YouTube page for the video versions, iTunes, Stitcher, Google Play, and Audio Boom for all the audio versions. You can find the cheat sheet up at dkplaybook.com. If you're looking for my betting cheat sheet, it is up on my Facebook page, facebook.com slash the PME. Good luck with the Sony Open. I'll see you next time.